Welcome to the American Roadrunner Podcast. Glad you could join us for this episode. I am your host, Bob Marshall. Here we share stories from the road, all tales from our two-wheeled motorcycle machines. Whether you're a beginner or advanced rider, on-road or off-road, wrencher, racer, commuter, or just a weekend warrior, this is the podcast for you. Named after the book, American Roadrunner. Enjoy, my fellows. Part two, Melissa Holbrook Pearson. We're going to get to the show here in a second, but first, a story. I didn't take my headset off. Last night, I got home from work, and I knew I was sick. I could feel the temperature going crazy in my body, and my throat just felt like it was on fire, so forgive if I sound a little off. So I went over to urgent care, and Got a Z-Pack and some other good meds, and the doctor took one look at my throat and said, Wow, this is the worst case of strep throat I've seen all year. So I thought, well, that's great. So I came home, took my meds, and proceeded to crash the fuck out. I woke up this morning to a phone call from Jer and a text from Annette. Jer was telling me my good friend Jesse Combs had passed away land speed racing. If you didn't know who Jesse Combs was, she was this awesome young woman who did great things and always wanted to go fast and far, always wanted to build, and she had a lot of medias to share it all on, TV shows, YouTube channels, social medias, you name it. She was always very busy spreading the word that it's okay for women to do awesome things and more importantly it's okay for her to do awesome things and she really did a lot of that for me it all started five or six years ago when i was sitting in a bar in ventura and we were all there for the david mann show i was there with my best friend f-bomb and i suspect jesse was there with some of those other born friends we share like milwaukee mike or halecha or uh, who knows? Uh, anyways, I was sitting across the table from Charlie. We were talking, and all of a sudden, I looked over me, and there's this young blonde standing over me. And I thought, "Oh, am, am I on your seat?" And she went, "Oh no, I just wanted to meet you." And I thought, well, "How did this young woman want to meet me? That doesn't make any sense." And she pointed to a patch on my jacket, one of my Landspeed racing patches, and she went, "Oh, you're you're a Landspeed racer. I am too." I said, oh, yeah, well, I do this, that, and the other. And for those of you who don't know, land speed racing for me is something I do with my family. It's great to spend quality time together building a bike and then taking it out land speed racing. And I'm only on course for a few minutes. Other than that, we're busy hanging out, camping out, and enjoying each other. So if you ever want a good family fun activity, land speed racing is the way to go, in my opinion. So I told her about that, and then she proceeded to tell me about her land speed racing and and what she was getting ready to do with the North American Eagle. In the world of land speed racing, the North American Eagle was pretty exciting. Ed Shackle and a few other good guys were getting this old F fighter plane out of some old barn somewhere, and they cut the wings off and put some wheels on it and turned it into a jet-powered land speed car. I do wheel-powered land speed racing, but regardless, she was real excited to hear my story, and boy, I was real excited to meet her, because I knew they had gotten someone cool to drive the North American Eagle. I just didn't realize it was her. So at the end of it all, we walked away, and I gave her my card, and she gave me a postcard. And I've always kept the postcard up on a cork board in my house here, Just to remind me that it's okay to be young and awesome and do good things. I keep it right here in my dining room next to where I eat dinner. Throughout the years, we got to run into each other at different events, which was always great because she would ask me, hey, how's your land speed racing or how's your chopper racing or how's this, that, and the other. And I always thought that was a bit odd because she very much treated me like an equal. 
And the answer is we weren't equal. She was doing much more awesome things than I was doing, in my opinion. And everywhere I went, everyone knew who she was. She was very good at making people feel like the center of the universe that she talked to, that she dealt with. And I think we were all very blessed to have her around. I don't know the circumstances of her death or her accident, and I honestly don't care. What I do care about is that I was fortunate enough to know her and get to call her my friend, as a lot of us did. I don't have resources or reasons to do anything. What I do have is a podcast. And I can tell us all it's going to be okay for us to be good to ourselves about this. However we deal with life, death, and everything in between is all going to be different for us. But my opinion's always been it's okay to live life to the fullest. And I know that my friend Jesse Combs went out going faster than any other woman in history. And from what I knew of her, I reckon that'd be the way she'd want it to be. She was only 36 years of age, but with everything she did and everyone's life that she touched, it was all very magical, and she was a very magical person. The last time I got to hang out with her was at Born Free. I finally got to meet her boyfriend, Terry, which was great because I had heard a lot of great things about him and boy the answer is it's all correct that guy is awesome and he does awesome things on two wheels or off-road or many many different things I can't begin to imagine what he's going through right now what Jesse's family's going through but I'm gonna do my very best to give them all the respect that they deserve as they're in my prayers I think the universe has an answer for all of us. Whatever that answer may be, good, bad, or indifferent, fair or unfair to the rest of us. It was very exciting for me to get to know Jesse Combs and for me to get to call her my friend. One of the last times I got to hang out with Jesse at Born Free, I remember she was real busy shooting a video of me talking trash on our good friend Chopper Charlie. If you don't know, Charlie's wife Kayla and Jesse were good friends. They even wrote a book, Joey and the Chopper Boys, which was pretty exciting to read the last time I was up at Charlie and Kayla's house just a few weeks ago. I'm going to have to pick up a copy of that soon enough. Joey and the Chopper Boys has some great illustrations. It's a great book. So as I'm busy telling Jesse about the race and a few things and talking crap on Chopper Charlie. She was real busy recording it. And that's one of my great last memories of her recording me just kind of being a dork (laughs) and talking trash on Chopper Charlie. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the answer is Charlie completely kicked my ass in our ride 1K in a day race. But it sure was great to get to compete with him, of course. And it was great to share all that with Jesse. I know after the race, she sent me a message on uh, Instagram, I think, and just kind of said congratulations on being in the arena. And and I think we went off talking about female catheters and do they exist? And I think her answer was she had looked into some research on it, but there just wasn't enough call or support for such a device. So go figure. I reckon that's a funny thing people like us would talk about. I know, too, I had gotten to share with Jesse that I was reaching out to Melissa Holbrook Pearson to be on this podcast, and I know Jesse knew exactly who Melissa was. I don't have all the answers on life, love, and death, and everything in between, but what I do know is that people like Melissa Holbrook Pearson are ones that really touch me and all their writing about their writing. So I hope you really enjoy this interview. Part two, the show, Melissa Holbrook Pearson. And I'm going to miss you, my dear friend, Jesse. Thanks for all the inspirations for all of us. And thank you all for letting me share my story. I'm going to spend the rest of the day trying to heal up and get better. Because tomorrow, Thursday, August 29th, 
I plan to jump on a chopper, head on up to Durango, Colorado for the Four Corners Rally. I'll be hanging out with uh, Jer and Willie Jacks and the whole Jacks family and a bunch of other friends are coming in. Even Annette's coming in from her ride up in Oregon. She was just on. It's going to be really exciting. If you should happen to see me, feel free to stop and say hi. Maybe share a good story of Jesse. Until then, enjoy this show. Part 2, Melissa Holbrook Pearson. I think the other day we were chatting and you said uh, Saturdays were for riding motorcycles. You have a significant you have a significant other you get to ride with these days on Saturdays. Yes, I do. Or or any other days that we might choose <laughs> or be able to. Amen. Um, yeah, you know there it's. Um, John gave me many, many, many gifts. Um, some of which I can't fully articulate, but his final gift was to um, introduce me to somebody. He was always he was always looking out for my best interests. And sure. So um, you know, I over the years I've received you know phone calls and messages from people. You know, I've got a guy you need to meet, and it would always be like. Well, okay, yeah. let's see, let's see. And, you know, because, Well, you're pretty easy um, on the eyes, if I may be. So <laughs> you're sweet, thank you. But it's just, you know, it's a very particular thing, right? Amen. You, know, you just, who can, who can enumerate all the, the qualities that, um, that will strike us or you know just be right i'm not looking for perfection i'm not perfect um but you want somebody who um who really hits those fundamental notes the things that are most important to you and um you know just over and over and over again and and sorry you know it's just (laughs) there's just it's just not right. right but uh you know, the minute John called me, he said, you need to get down to Long Island. There's a guy here you need to meet. And I said, look, I'm pretty busy, okay? <laughs> I don't have I'm Actually, I actually, you know, I've got work and I've got a child and I've got stuff going on. So if he really wants to meet me, let him come up here. And by golly, he did. <laughs> and Smart man. The, I, you know, I watched him ride up, interestingly, on an FJR. Great. But before he'd even taken off his gear, I was watching from the window, and I said, hmm, there's something here. I just wonder. And it was instantaneous. It was like they write about in the books and the songs. <laughs> um, and he's somebody for whom motorcycles are uh at the center of his life it's what he wants to do it's you know he's done a lot in his life and you realize that motorcycles are really pretty much it that's Um, great and and so here we are and then uh it was uh literally on our our first you know, substantive date, which consisted of, of course, a weekend ride. Perfect. That that I learned that John had had died, yeah. and I really felt as though he had, not that he had known that that was going to happen, but maybe I think somewhere in him he did, and he wanted to give me something lasting. Um, beyond himself it really almost felt as though okay i know what's going to happen i know i'm not going to be around for much longer i want to give you something that will last and that's a true gift Mm. and and he did it was you know i mean to say that 
learning that he had died uh, was a crushing I can imagine. event. It was, you know, I, I, nothing. I've lost my father. I've lost my mother. Yeah. I lost a dog who was like my child, and none of those felt as quite as stunning and wrong as John's death at that at that moment. But what can I say? You know, a few very short while before he died, he was interviewed by somebody, and I think you can still find this interview on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, and the interviewer asked him, well, you know, if you could choose how you want to die, how would that be? And John looked at him like, what are you, nuts? <laughs> He's on the bike, of course. And that... He died doing what was most central to his life. Yeah. And I don't think he would have wanted it any other way. Went out with his boots on. Yeah. Definitely to be admired. And he was uh, he was just out for a ride getting from point A to point B. He wasn't racing. No, yeah, but he was always racing. You yeah, know, he yeah. was always... He, he he never did anything halfway. Yeah. Uh, so that was always, he's going to do it uh, the, the fastest way. Um, and nobody really knows what happened or why. Um, and at this point, there's really, I don't know, not much reason to try to speculate. You said it well. I totally yeah. agree. And I've been accused myself, as I know we've all been accused of living life in the same fashion and similar manners. But at the end of the day, uh, I wish I knew how to express to you uh, and to him how much inspiration you guys gave someone like me who wanted to race choppers of all things cross country to mm -hmm. the point where I, you know, I even bought a gold wing and started doing a bit of racing on that. Um, which is, boy, what a wonderful machine. <laughs> mm -hmm. A big old 94 Goldwing that I just enjoy the heck out of. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the future hold for you? You got any more uh, IBA events in you? You know, I I don't really think so. I realize I did it enough to know that I'm not that person. Mm -hmm. I admire the heck out of the people who do. Um, I love that world, and I... I see how incredibly beautiful that family is. The long distance family yep. is probably the tightest group of intense people I've ever encountered. But I was always standing at the edges looking in and trying I, to figure out what made them tick. And I know the feeling. Um, you know, what? what's really going on here? Um, I just, I, it's, it's an insular world where, I mean, in order to do that at the level that these people are doing it, in some ways it has to be kept secret and it has to be, um, they, you know, the level of trust needs to be, um, so complete yes. that, um, it's not, it's not a porous thing. It's not a place where you can sort of just eh, skip in and skip out. Um, right. Sort of not really invested. They are in it for blood and for life. Yeah. And the way that they're connected to each other is one of the most beautiful things I've, I've ever seen. Um, but, Actually, you know, after I did a 24-hour rally and um, I did a saddle sore, I was frankly sort of like, okay, I've done that. Now I don't have to do that again. It's punishing. Oh, you I, know? I, I know, and I keep coming you back know, for more. I that's my problem. <laughs> exactly. So that that's that's where that that's where that boundary is. It's the people who do it and say. Oh my gosh, that was something else. Now I'm going to go and do, do more, it again. farther, faster, and you know I can't get enough of this. And then there are those who said, "Okay, well I've 
I've experienced that now, and I really don't have to do that again. Yeah. That's the difference. That's the difference. But it's just, you know, it's just, it's a personality thing. I wouldn't want there to only be one type of music in the world, right? Amen. Or yes. one type of literature or one type of anything. Yes. Um, the, the, the great thing is the human capacity for plurality and for embellishing and for diving deep. But in order to dive deep, you have to make a choice. I'm going to do this and not that. Right. We, can't, <laughs> we can't do it all to an extreme and truly experience um, the essence of any endeavor without, you know, sort of de facto saying, well, that means that I'm also not going to do that. Right. And I've come to a point in my life where I, I have to make choices. And my choice is really, here's what I want to do. I want to write the things that I have left in me to write and I want to um, travel by motorcycle as much as possible and not necessarily do it fast. I just want to get on the bike and go because by experiencing place on this type of conveyance, right. um, together those two things make a separate magic. And that's what I crave. I'm sort of addicted to motorcycle travel ah that's wonderful well and i'll be the first to admit i've been slowing down i'm only 42 and uh well i raced about a month and a half ago but other than that well that's not that's not that, quite slowing down <laughs> I don't, you're not you're not looking at the end of what you're going to be doing. Uh, I, 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 I see more craziness in your future. <laughs> but isn't it nice every so often just to do a few hundred miles a day, stop at all the sites, hang out with all the tourists and motorhomes, uh, you know, enjoy all the things they're enjoying, find that great little restaurant, that great little coffee house, find that weirdo in the corner on a typewriter. You know, and just mm -hmm. talk to people and just travel and enjoy all the different parts of our country. And every so yeah, often I get to do that. So good. But, but yeah, it's definitely well, even the last race I did, I did a thousand miles, 24 hours uh, through the ride one K in a day. Uh, I ended up killing it in what, 17 hours. And then I spent a week just up in Oregon, Portland, hung out with my cousin for a few days, visited, visited some friends on the way down, and just rode for a few hundred miles, and I'd stop in Sacramento, and, yeah, you know, whatever. And I was really proud of myself. It took me all week to get back from Oregon. I mean, just totally uh -huh. unprecedented for me. So uh, it was good stuff. I'm getting ready to go up to Durango here in a week uh, for the, uh, four corners rally. I got a lot of friends. Oh, up there. are you going? Cool. Yeah. 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 It should be a, should be a good rally. I got friends right there in Durango. They're all pretty excited. And these are friends that I've raced choppers with cross country in the old stampede race. So they know me pretty well and they know my addictions and they know my <laughs> machines and they know anyways it'll it's only gosh it's just under 800 miles i think between here and durango it's just a nice little ride so mm -hmm. should be a should be a good one you do get some snow up there where you live you get to work around that in the winter time yeah no it's you know it's funny for winter it's a time when i sort of i feel like i i forget the I ride, right. maybe because I have to. Um, you know, the motorcycles are asleep, and every once in a while, I'll go into the garage, and I'll go, wait a minute. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Oh, man. And then as soon as spring starts stirring, then I'll, you know, the anticipation, and, and also the worry sometimes right. I'll always inevitably have these dreams after not riding for a few months okay. where I've gotten on a bike and I, I've forgotten how to ride or, Oh my God, I didn't remember that, you know, the rear wheel was bigger than the front wheel or something <laughs> weird. And, you know, what happened to my bike? But my bike is transformed into something I don't recognize. Mm -hmm. And then you get out on the, on the first ride and it just 
it clicks back into place and you're like, oh, what was I worried about? What was I? It's just it's just that time I used the winter to sort of sink back into uh, my brain, which is not always a pleasant place, but <laughs> well, <laughs> it I'm, is my home. Yeah, no, I'm I'm so glad to have you share that, and I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. I had a bad dream several years ago when I first got my gold wing and you can't see the front wheel on a gold wing. And that really freaked me out at first. It wasn't something I was used to. I'm used to, you know, stripped down motorcycles. So I had this dream that the front wheel caved in, fell apart, knocked over, you know, and the wheels. So I I text my dad the next day and I go, man, I had this really bad dream. He goes, well, are you going to sell it? Are you going to get back on it? I said, well, no, I, I think I'm going to get back on it. Just trust that the front wheel's not going to fall apart. He goes, well, you could always wear a helmet to bed. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know, I thought, wow. It, anyways, thanks for sharing that. I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. I mean, it's it's rough if I don't ride for a few days. Um, and of course, it's very rare these days. I don't. The weather's so good here. Uh, and I only work, a, I, I, I live just a few miles from where I work, so it's real easy to ride a motorcycle to work every day. It works out uh, works out pretty well. Um, You're lucky. I'm, I'm very lucky. You have a long commute yourself? I have no commute at all. I walk, I walk a few feet uh, to my studio above the garage, so I don't really have to go anywhere. That's and wonderful. If I wanna, yeah, yeah very lucky i mean the downside is i can't earn much money but for me that's a fair exchange to not have to go into an office i agree i need to get on that soon enough you uh get to write for several hours a day then or i i wouldn't mind if uh if listeners i think there's a lot of listeners who enjoy writing in an amateur form whether they're journaling or sitting down at a computer and uh, I wouldn't mind if would you mind spending a few minutes talking about your writing process? Yeah, in as much as there is a process to it, it's it's more mysterious for me than that. I I admire those writers who manifest this discipline and they're at their desks every day at eight and write right. for three hours or whatever, but <laughs> that ain't me. Um, I really do. I respond well to deadlines. Okay. I, whenever, whenever anybody says, oh, can you write this for me or even just give me a comment or a blurb or something, I'm like, tell me when you need it by, because if it's not on the calendar and if it's not pressing on me, it's very hard to summon the muse. So um, I'm not very regular about my my writing practice. Um, and sometimes I need to really sort of lash myself to the desk and, nope, you've got to get this done. Or, mm. you know, here's just an idea and and take it somewhere um so it's it's not really much of a process as much as it is um a little bit of a give and take and a struggle and a and a, and a big mystery when it's going to work and when it's not that's okay. right so you don't you don't always sit down and and straight off the bat produce something that's readable i sure don't oh no the secret to writing for all those fellow listeners the secret to writing is rewriting <laughs> a oh lot, yeah a lot yes, of rewriting mm-hmm. well that's good i know yep. personally i like to start i do a rough draft usually on a typewriter i'm very fascinated by these funny typewriter machines and then i move it to my computer but even then i use a wireless keyboard that clicks similar to a typewriter and i just compose yeah. it over uh but i I really enjoy typing, and I'm left-handed, so writing uh, pen to paper in general smears terribly. So typing makes so much more sense to me. So, mm-hmm. uh, well, works. that's the way it's been done for a long time. I find that my thinking is different um, depending on what um, device I'm using. So sure. I sometimes have to flow back and forth between writing in, um, you know, with a pen and paper um, and writing on the computer. And I always edit on hard copy because maybe just because I grew up on the, you know, 
back in the dark ages when that was all we had. And there's <laughs> something to me about the feel of, you know, you talk about rewriting. For me, editing, the, the, the better part of Valor there is the leading. And mm. um, I love the feeling of putting my pencil down hard and striking out lines and words. And somehow I can only really accomplish that by, um, you know, real analog method. And that's sort of, that's also how I, I ride a motorcycle. I just, I am not into technology. And um, one time I, I uh, took a trip with a friend, um, we were gonna, he was photographing and also guiding me on this tour and I was gonna do the writing and he said, hey, it's gonna be a great idea to have uh, these Bluetooth so that we can talk oh, and gosh. we can say, so, you know, I can say, hey, let's turn around here or whatever. Um, and to me, it was the most horrifying experience because it was like I had somebody else inside my head. That's right. And I couldn't get them out. That's right. I knew I, there was no way I could shut the door or say I need to be alone here with my thoughts because that's really how where writing begins is in my thoughts. Um, and I need to be alone in order to do that. I really, I need physically to be alone. So that was a an interesting experiment in learning what I don't want. I don't want something right. in my head, so I'm no. not even connected to a GPS or anything. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, God forbid, that a text is coming in when I'm riding. I do not want that. No, no, you don't. No. And I'm going to yeah. remember and tell you, thank you for writing all about that in your book, because I've learned as most people know, it's okay. I do not use GPS. I take a piece of tape and put it on my tank and ahead of time write down all the directions in a Sharpie right quick. But if I got to pull over and look at a map, I'm okay doing that. I certainly don't do the in-ear thing. I do have a Senna built into my uh, helmet uh, that was a present uh, from Senna uh, via MotoFam. Anyways, it's great to listen to music or audible books, but other than that, no, thank you for writing about that because it's amazing how technology will push forward and will grasp onto it thinking this is the way you do it. If you're if you're going to yeah. ride motorcycles long distance, you, you better rock a GPS. And I've tried a few. I've tried. I promise I've tried. And they just don't get along with me and I don't get along with them. And as you've written, you end up on a dead end street in some neighborhood in the middle of nowhere when you're supposed to be, you know, at a Marriott. So it just doesn't work. I mean, yeah, absolutely crazy. I mean, two, two examples from... Um, you know, given by my significant other, um, who's more maybe more GPS dependent than I am, sure. um, and I do I do exactly what you do. I've got the written out directions in my uh, in my map pocket in front of me sure. because if there's a screen there, I'm going to be looking at it because we're programmed. That's how our brains mm -hmm. work, and that's why we're as addicted as we are um and we were just on a on a little local ride and i sometimes get turned around and i'm thinking wait a minute i've been to this intersection before and i remember you either turn right or you turn left and i just sometimes i just blank on it um <laughs> which is not a big deal so you make the wrong turn and you correct but um I think because he was in the lead, he felt as though he had to make the right choice. And we're coming down a uh, a curvy road, um, descending corners, and here comes a stop sign. And so he looks down at the GPS to see what it's telling him to do. And that was the moment at which he needed to be turning and you know, not turning quite as far right, and the front wheel went into a ditch, and oh, the bike went over, and we had a, you know, a badly broken wrist that now has 
plates in it and whatnot, right. and all for it really all for nothing because right. in the end, you know, we were ten miles from home, and it's not like anything terrible would have happened to us, and the sharks would have gotten us. No. So that that to me was a lesson in. You know, at that moment, I was thinking, ah, oh, you know, I need to get a new GPS, and I should really have this, and that's what everybody does. And that just, right then and there, I went, mm-mm, nope, yeah. not happening. Not happening. Um, yeah, so it's just, I don't know, It's. It, I think that it's a matter of personal preference. I mean, certainly you couldn't do, you can't do serious um, long-distance rallies without multiple GPS at this right, point. Right. You could not you can't ride the Iron Butt rally without relying on it. It's simply not possible. But um you know, not not for the kind of riding I do. I can still just I glance down and I've got my own form of shorthand refined over the years <laughs> and uh, you know, as long as I can see my arrows I'm good. And, you know, what my ride on Saturday was just, I'm going out, and somebody, I forget, this, some a motorcyclist told me this a long time ago, GPS is to turn them on after your ride when you need to get home. But going out is the getting lost. That's, that's what, great. That's what, that's what riding is. So that's what I, you know, I carry my phone in my pocket, and I just head it out, and said, huh, I wonder what this road is like. Yeah. And it was just a brilliant ride. Yeah, curves are good. Straight lines are to be avoided. Uh, Perseg <laughs> wrote, per wrote that best. No, I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. yeah, no I'm, I'm a big fan, and I think it does teach patience and humiliation that we're just not used to in today's society. You got to be patient. If you make a wrong turn, give yourself 30 seconds. Uh, I've, there's been many times where I have several people following me and I make the wrong turn and they all kind of flip out or freak out. And I'm like, it, let's give it half a mile. Oh, look, here's a great driveway that 20 of us can fit in and turn around. Cause Bob yeah. made the right and, turn. and, and you gotta ask like, what, is this really a mistake to, to get lost? No. Actually, no, getting yeah. lost is the goal. Hmm. Well said. Well said. Boy, I got to tell you, Melissa, it's it's amazing to chat with you. And I just can't thank you enough for all your writing about writing that's uh, inspired me and, and thousands and countless others and everything else. Your introduction to long distance riding, uh, Iron Butt Association. You also taught me it's okay to have really long titles at the on your books. So I really <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, you know, just go for it. Right. Why not? Mm-hmm. I've uh I've done similar. Uh do you got new any new uh books or any new writings coming out here in the near future? Um nothing I can really speak of. I've got things on that back burner, a couple things on the front burner. Good. I'll let you know. Good. Well, that's really exciting, and uh, you can imagine we're we're very excited to uh, to read more of your goodness in the uh, near and or far future because it's uh, it's pretty good stuff. Even the stuff you've written about, uh, you know, dogs and and everything else, I I've, I've gotten to get into a little. So, uh, and you got uh, a few books on Audible as well. I know the man who would stop at nothing's on Audible as well as. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, and I'm gonna. Um, the per- it's interesting. The perfect vehicle is now. Gosh, is it twenty? Yeah, twenty-two years old. Yeah. This book, right? And it's just going. It's going to be published in a Spanish edition. Oh, now. that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited about it because a friend, I mean, now, that book has brought me friends all over the world. I've met people um, through that book. I've met you. Yeah. Um, I've met so many wonderful people, and a friend of mine who's Italian, married to a Spaniard, (laughs) um, is starting a motorcycle-only publishing house okay out of their out of their out of their kitchen and they're doing spanish language editions of all the classic 
motorcycle parks, um, and mine is going to be one of them. That's great. So hopefully we'll get to go over to Spain for the release of that, um, and that would be really exciting because that's, you know, in the end, it's, it's what it's all about is just getting out, going forward, um, meeting people, riding different places. Mm. Well, I don't think I could hope for anything more in life. And that's really what motorcycles have given me, that opportunity. And it's a great example for the rest of us and even for people who do not ride yet. I always tell people mm -hmm. yet. People will tell me, oh, right. I don't ride motorcycles. I go, yet. Yep. It may happen yeah. someday because uh, I think... Um, I think it really is a future, and I think people like you talking about it as a future, writing about it, and educating the public in the future, uh, the little bits that I do uh, to do my part, as we all kind of do our parts as motorcycle riders, uh, through whatever means necessary, even this podcast. I have I know I've got handfuls of people who listen to this podcast who don't necessarily ride but they certainly mm -hmm. enjoy the information and the idea of riding in the near or even far future. But it definitely gives the rest of us who do ride something that nothing else does. And that's what always excites mm -hmm. me about it. Yes. Melissa, I apologize. I'm just checking over my list. This is a wonderful thing about editing. I can edit this kind of stuff out. Although everything else has been great. I don't think I have to edit anything out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Melissa, are we missing anything that you can think of, ma'am? I can't think of anything. Yeah. I mean, you know, we could, we could, of course, we could sit here and talk <laughs> about bikes till kingdom come, really. Oh, but, I know uh, what it was. I, I got one here. Yeah. Um, your son, a uh, college uh, student these days, right? Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Mine, I got one yeah. that just graduated from college. Do you see him riding in the near future? Does he ride now? What's his opinion on it? No, he doesn't. I think he's sort of um, a little bemused okay. by the fact that his mother rides. <laughs> but um, And for a while before he got a car, which he doesn't have anymore, um, he was riding this little uh, pooch that we had, and I could see that spark that we all feel at the beginning of our motorcycle lives okay. when we first experience it. He was, um, you know, oh, I don't have to wait for you to take me here. I I don't have to sit at home. I can. I can just get on this machine and it's going to take me somewhere else. Right. Twist the uh, throttle. He was thrilled. And, yeah. Just, uh. just, he, he would come back and he'd say, mom, have you ever been up that road before? <laughs> it's so beautiful. I love it. So that was, that was just, of course though, it's, it's a little ironic because here I am replicating my mother who would always be, do you have to ride that thing? <laughs> you know, I'm coming. I'm coming to Ohio. She'd say, "You're coming in the car." I hope. And I, no, actually, Mom, I'm not. <laughs> but you know, then, and I thought she was just absurd. I just couldn't bear it. And then there I was, you know, watching my son put on his helmet and, you know, getting ready to head out on the moped. And I'd be thinking, oh, God, I don't really, you know, these roads with their blind corners because, you know, of course, he was not riding in the center of the lane. Right. Um, and, but, it all, you know, it all worked out. So I don't know what is in his future, but I'll tell you, if he did decide to, um, you, that this was the direction he wanted to go, I would get him out on a dirt bike first mm. because Everybody I know who started on dirt bikes are better ride riders than anybody who started on the street. Well, that's I very think. true. Yeah, I agree. I started all BMX back. I'm actually getting ready to release a prequel of my book. 
and it talks about how BMX racing was the gateway drug for me to to motorcycles, oh. but all that was mm-hmm. off-road, and I, I did have an off-road motorcycle as well. My best friend's dad would take us up in the hills, which, of course, is now all built into luxury houses, but, you know, I got to putt around on uh, a little Honda 100 off-road Regardless, I, I, I do agree, and I wish I wish more children had the opportunity to kind of do that. I know my little dude's done some flat track racing. He's 13 now, so I suspect in the future he'll ride quite a bit. But you're right, learning to manipulate a machine to, that has an engine that powers you instead of pedaling, especially off-road, yeah, that's a huge advantage. Man, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. I need to go take another off-road class. That's what I need to do. Yeah, yeah, and it's and the people I know who 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 are riding dirt, you know, people who have ridden street bikes all their lives, you know, sort of finally got a little what I don't know, whatever, jaded, bored. They they've done it all. Rediscover riding and the intense joy of it right. by going back to the dirt. Right, right, and I'm real lucky here. Well, you're pretty lucky there, too. You got a lot of off-road. I'm really in the off-road capital of the world. I mean, I think I've got Mm -hmm. four flat tracks and X amount of off-road tracks within 10 minutes of me. I mean, it's pretty. And I got Chaparral right down the street. They're the largest motorcycle dealership in the world, and they've got every off-road motorcycle you could ever dream of, as well as street. Yeah, Yeah, no, that, that is pretty exciting. It's nice when the road ends to... Because, boy, trying to operate a street bike uh, off-road is, is, is always a bit fun. Mm-hmm. I've always been pretty lucky, but there's a few things I just cannot do. And that's a wonderful thing yeah. about riding motorcycles, too. You can always get a little bit better. Oh, yeah. Have you, uh, have you gotten better at turning the bike around <laughs> yourself? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It all, de- it all depends. Okay, uh, good. My, small, my smaller bikes, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's why that's why I like them. It is funny to know you or get to know you through all your writing, and you write about uh, <laughs> give me give me seven lanes to turn this motorcycle around. Or I might be quoting that wrong, but uh, you know, and it was the same for me. And I know I've got that problem these days. You know, you give me twelve feet, I'll turn a gold wing around in it, and then I go, oh wait, someone was following me. <laughs> And they're back there cursing yeah. at me going, nobody else can turn like that, Bob. I'm going, well, this hydraulic clutch makes it real easy. I'm sorry. I forgot. Uh-huh. You know, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, I've, I've gotten real good at the on-road stuff. But, yeah, the off-road stuff. And now we've got the Trans-American Trail. I could ride off-road all the way from my house to your house, the way the map looks. So I'm, right? pretty, I'm pretty excited about that in the near and or far future. I got a few plans to to hit that trail as soon as possible, but I'd like to do it on a rebel two fifty. I think that oh, would yeah, be, that'd be fun. Well, you don't, you know, you just don't need much. I mean, we're the only country that's got these monster motorcycle engines and I, I just know. don't I always know. see, unless you're up on the highway in Montana, Idaho, you know, Wyoming, you know, it's just no, uh, there's just not the need for it. So that's why I'm such yeah. a fan of the little box. Even though I'm such a big guy, I look ridiculous on the little box. But boy, I enjoy them. I enjoy yeah. them quite a bit. Melissa, it's been an absolute joy. I just can't thank you enough for being on the podcast and having such a wonderful discussion. I'm going to let you go to bed. I know it's a little later there where you are now. And I uh, thank you greatly. And uh, I'm hoping to have you on again in the future. I'd love to. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Okay. Bye-bye. Glad you enjoyed today's podcast. The book, American Roadrunner, can be found on the website at AmericanRoadRunnerTheBook.com. Also on Amazon, search American Roadrunner by Bob Marshall. And, of course, available in most digital formats. Find it on eBay and at ChopCult at the online store, ChopCult.com. Find us on Instagram, American Roadrunner, all one word. Keep up with us on Facebook, American Roadrunner. This has been your host, Bob Marshall, fellow wrencher, rider, adventure seeker, racer, storyteller, and author of the book, American Roadrunner. Music is brought to you by Meek. 
their song, Here We Are, off their album Red Sprite Lightning, Meet. Until next time, keep the rubber side down and enjoy your road.